I'm Anders Varner. This is Barbell Shrug. Doug Larson's in the top left. Travis Mash. Dr. Aaron Horshake from Squat University. Welcome to the show. That was the official intro, even though we what go. we just did was way cooler. I just thought we, people should know this is an official thing now. Yeah, we're talking about Nelly. <laughs> we were talking about Three, Nelly. Mafia. Three, Three Six Mafia. Three Six Mafia. If you Chris. land, if you get on the plane <laughs> and you land in Memphis, Three Six Mafia should be there. St. Louis, Missouri, Nelly should be there, and Ludacris should be in Atlanta. Yeah, That's exactly. how I feel every time I get off the plane. If it was like a real movie, that would be like, oh, Nelly picked you up, and you're going to Club 112. You must be in Atlanta. Jermaine yeah. Dupree's going to be there. It's going to be awesome. And if I go back to L.A., Tupac should come back to life. Right? Yeah, right. For sure. West side? Well, the problem yes. with L.A. is when you drive up the five and you get closer to L.A., every single exit, you know people got shot. Because you look at them like, oh, that's the, that's the Compton exit. That's terrifying. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, Inglewood exit. That's next. God, Inglewood? I don't yeah. – do not get off the interstate here. This is terrifying. I heard all the people got shot there. Yeah. Did you guys watch that movie about NWA? Yeah. Oh, yeah. man. I love yeah. them growing up. I love them growing up. <laughs> <laughs> This is totally what you thought you were going to come on the show today. Talk about, right? Hey, if we're talking 90s hip-hop, I'm game. That's, that's my jam right there. <laughs> Call Galpin up. Yeah. Bring him on. Let's go. <laughs> like Galpin, Galpin, Galpin knows a shocking about amount about, about rap from the 90s. He really you can does. tell from his, from his YouTube videos, it's, it sounds like 90s rap. Right. Oh, it, 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 the, his dog's name is the Ghostface Killer from the Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> they call him Ghost. Yeah, I just uh, <laughs> got finished training, and... Uh, I had some Wu Tang on today, and I was just thinking, oh, really? oh no, my neighbors—they're not going to appreciate <laughs> this at all. They do not want to hear Triumph right now, just blasting out of my garage for 20 minutes. Um, dude, well, how does it do feel it, that you're helping Travis Mash get through grad school to get his PhD? You're like the I talk number about one resource. Yeah, you're one yeah. of the top three. You, Lane, and of course Andy. And I, that's an honor to be grouped with those guys. Those guys do such amazing work. So just, just to hear my name even mentioned with those guys is, is still crazy to hear. All yeah. three of you have been you know, pretty profound. What, what were you saying a moment ago about, about training one of the strong men? Yeah, so I've been fortunate enough to work with uh, Martins Lises, who was the 2019 World's Strongest Man. Um, and just like any strength athlete, I mean, no one goes through life just 100% feeling great all the time so he's had his own uh injuries over the past couple of years that sort of just culminated to the point where he he couldn't compete much anymore and mm -hmm. he's actually one of the smartest athletes that i've worked with in that he knew it was time to take a step back and address all the things that were going on so that he can be as strong as possible returning and actually you know kick some ass again so we've been able to work together for a long time and in, in uncovering a lot of the movement issues that a lot of people up into this point and just try to be, you know, addressing the symptoms of pain, which is what in large part, what our medical community is set up to do nowadays right. is just treat symptoms. And uh, so j taking a little bit more of a movement based approach. Um, and we've been really successful so far. Is he going to go back? after He you? is, yeah. he is going to. Um, so, we started working together just over DM and email at first, just because he was in California at the beginning of uh, everything with COVID going on. But he was able to come out in the middle of the summer. We worked together for an entire weekend. And then we've just been going back and forth ever since, just you know, tweaking his programming, trying new things. Um, it didn't help that he got hit by a car halfway through. I saw that. <laughs> that was I missed that. He's incredibly mobile, too, by the way. But go ahead and oh, tell him about the car. Yeah, yeah I want to hear the car. That's what surprised yeah. me the most about that dude. Did he win? The car – no way the car hurt him. Uh, the car hurt him enough to take him out of the 2020 World's Strongest Man. But, uh, yeah, he's – I mean, I don't want to see what that car looked like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like didn't, he also set, didn't he also set Seriously. the deadlift world record recently or something um, close to it? I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah. There have been other strongmen who have done um, amazing different deadlift records as of recent, but uh, mm -hmm. Martins is an overall great athlete as far as the things that he's capable of doing. He's a very well-rounded athlete. I think you're talking about the, is Brian, um, what's the other American Shaw. guy? Brian Shaw. Shaw. He did, he did a really heavy deadlift, but like elevated, you know, like it was like off blocks or something, but the two, yeah. still the two top dudes I think are going to be, um, it's going to be, the two big guys are about to box. Those oh, Thor. Guys. Yeah, Thor and Eddie Hall. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. as far as I know, I don't know. If I, think, uh, yeah, oh, I, I think. I think I'm thinking of Thor, running. actually. Yeah. So yeah. Thor. Half, half Thor did the, what, it was 1,100 pound deadlift? Yeah, like yeah. he beat yeah. him by like one kilo. Like 11, like 1102, I want to say. Chipped him. The look. Eddie, Eddie Hall had done 1,100. 
Yeah, when Eddie Hall pulls eleven hundred and he's got like he like collapses at the end and blood's squirting out of his nose and all this, and everyone's like, God <laughs> freaking out, and they pan over to his wife. That's the real story right there. She is terrified. She yeah. knows what's going on with him. And that is one of the scariest looks. You don't ever want your wife to have that look when you're Martin doing something. Martin looks way more healthy and way more – like he moves more athletically than yeah. I feel like the other guys. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, what is – he doesn't seem to be quite as like, you know, I mean, if you talk about top-end strength, he doesn't seem to be like, you know, the guy who could win a powerlifting like Eddie Hall might. But mm-hmm. like – but he just seems super athletic. Like what is yeah. your what is your take on that from being well and and that's the thing too is you know when we're talking about world's strongest man it's not necessarily who can be the strongest in just one event right you know it's it's similar to the CrossFit Games now there's a lot of different uh, tests of strength and agility and things like that um, that you know over the course of an entire weekend culminate with with the winner um, one of the things if you actually go back with when he won in 2019 and even some of his earlier. Um, events he's a great technician he's a very very smart athlete so you'll see for example I know in one of the squat events where they were having like I don't know 750 pounds or something on their back and there was a lot of guys who were having a difficult time actually getting to depth because oh, they're yeah. so stiff they're such big yeah. guys yeah. Martins has such great control. I mean, you watch him right now. If you go just type in, you know, Martins Lisi's squat on YouTube, you know, you'll see a lot of his stuff. He has a great looking squat and it's fully controlled all the way to the bottom and back up. And he focuses on the the little idiosyncrasies of, of lifting, taking a good breath, a brace, perfect squat, great foot control. And I'm talking like when we were working together, 60 kilos on his back, the exact same way of moving every single time because he knows that the way in which you practice changes and in, in or yeah. allows you to carry over to how you want to compete sort of like you know talking to eddie cohen he's always talking about the way in which you move lightweight will dictate how you move heavyweight and i know for sure martins has that approach and it carries over to the way in which you see him you know compete. it's really awesome to see yeah. you find uh, that i just, I just- I just plugged that in, um, put his name in and put squat. And the very first thing that popped up was him doing 500 pounds. But he's like, he's low like you would see an Olympic weightlifter be low. Like high bar back squat all the way down. He's, he's wearing socks and shorts. Like he looks super yep. mobile. For how, that's for how big he is. Did he do Olympic weightlifting at all? Uh, no. He, he'll wow. do a little bit of Olympic weightlifting here and there. But he's never – I don't think he's ever competed in, weight, in weightlifting. Wow. I figured for sure. He's just been a very mobile, very mobile guy. I mean, he squats high bar. I mean, how many guys do you see – you know, yeah. that are in that type of strength realm yeah. that do a high bar squat. Right. Why, why does he choose to do that? Since low bar um, just is basically known to be the, a, a method where yeah. you can lift heavier weights. The way in which he explained it is he knew that a high bar would carry over to being a more of a well-rounded athlete because it allowed you to be in positions mm-hmm. that would carry over to different um, other, other lifts as much. Yeah, it's I got so he, tra- so he trains it, but in a competition, he would still choose low bar because in competition, he, the, he'll, he'll still the number of reps is large. Yeah, now hard. obviously, depending on the type of rig that you're using, because in strongman, you're not just using, you know, just a barbell. You may have a full axle or something like that across right. your back. The positioning is not going to be, I mean, it's going to be around that mid area. You know, it's not going to be yeah. that super low position, which mm-hmm. I think is going to be more specific uh, to powerlifting. Is he the first like elite strongman that you've worked with? Um, he is the first elite strongman. I've worked with other strength athletes in the past. Um, like but, strength uh, athletes, like weightlifters, bodybuilders, weight, weightlifters, and powerlifters are, yeah. are sort of my forte. Just being in Olympic weightlifting for so long, um, and then I've worked with a lot of uh, powerlifters. I worked with JP Price, who squatted over a thousand pounds out in Kansas City. We worked together. Um, I was fortunate enough when I went up to Canada for a seminar. Uh, Kelly Branton, who at the time was uh, chasing that thousand pound squat and was a multi time uh, Canadian national champion, got a couple uh, second and third place medals in the IPF Worlds um, prior in years past. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I've he always helps me thought. With my athletes, too, just a shout out to him. Like, he, he's is. always my go to. He's helping me with one as we speak. Mm-hmm. So, one of my top uh, female weightlifters. Yeah. yeah. I've always thought the strongmans were like the biggest freaks because they had to be so athletic. It's like powerlifting. Yeah. They just stand in place and do the thing. Um, mm-hmm. But, man, if you got to carry one of those Husafel stones all the way down 50 yards or whatever it is, Beast. you have to be a monster, like <laughs> yeah. very athletic to be able to get that stuff done. When you're working with those guys, how much does that, like, athleticism kind of almost surprise you when, when you see them move? 
Yeah, well, and, th and that's the thing is, you know, we often think of, of power lifters, you've got just your three lifts. And in strongman, there's so many uh, different implements and variety of lifting that you're doing. So you need to have more skills within your bag of, of things that you can pull out. So yeah. you have to have great single arm, single leg stability. You have to be able to walk with an implement. So, you know, things like that, that create sort of a well-rounded athleticism. And I think often whenever you're only training in powerlifting, right? And you're only doing bench squat deadlift. You get really good at those lifts, but sometimes you can have, and you can develop weak links within yeah. the game. Sort of like if you were looking at a pyramid that maybe has a couple blocks in the bottom that are just pulled out. As a whole, your structure is not as stable or as structurally sound as it could be. Yeah. And I think in Strongman, you sort of have to be very well-rounded and build that base from the ground up to really excel. And then not only excel, but stay there for a long time. As with any athlete, you know, we've all seen the athlete that maybe makes, you know, a huge spark in whatever, you know, weightlifting, powerlifting, CrossFit. But then within a year, they're sort of gone. They sort of fizzle out. Well, and often it's because the strength that they do have just isn't supported by enough structural quality movement. They don't have a firm foundation. That was me, I think. You know, honestly, like, you know, when I got to the tip top, I mean, it was hard for me to stay there because, like, you know, I think I won, I broke it comes record in 2004. And by 2006, I was a mess. Like, my whole body was just – you know, Aaron, I got a question. It's good, good that you're here because there's, like yeah. – lately, I've looked at, been looking at athletes, especially strength athletes, and you got weightlifters, powerlifters, you have the strong man. And so – and one thing I have I find in common of, like, the champions is that they, their, their um, approach and their emphasis on technique is, is superb. However, then there's two sides. Then there's the person – who doesn't do that, who I think is, is terrible. But then I think there's a, a third person who obsesses over it so much that they cannot allow themselves to, to do well. So like, yeah. have you found that to be true? I, I personally haven't met so many people that to such a degree, they, they value the technique that they never push themselves past it. Now, are there th those people out there? For sure. I'm not denying that. No. I feel like a lot of athletes um, have that innate desire to push, 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 because they're always looking performance wise yeah. to put at, you know, add five more kilos on the bar. At that's how we're just, yeah. That, that's why we're athletes. We love yeah. that performance. Right. So often it's more or less a, let me reel you back in a little bit than, Hey, it's okay. Put, put a little bit more weight on, you know? I so think I, weightlifting I've noticed, like I, I've had, like right now I have one, a guy mm -hmm. who's actually near you right now. And uh, you'll know I'm talking about him because I've been very clear with him. You know that I've, I've had one and I've had a female who I'm not going to say her name, maybe two females mm -hmm. that like honestly can't get past, like they obsess so much over technique. Yeah. Even when it's beautiful. And even when I show them on video, it's beautiful. They can't just say they, they're obsessing over something. They can't just roll on and be like, look, you're doing good. So therefore they never get past a certain point because mm -hmm. they have this, this glitch. I mean, like if the biomechanical patterns are perfect and like you're symmetrical, it's perfect. There's mm -hmm. nothing else to say. And so yeah. like, um, you know, powerlifting, I don't find that. I find the opposite. I find most people don't pay enough attention. And matter of fact, Americans right now make me super mad because I feel like, you know, that what is that Russian guy's name who's absolutely amazing? And his attention to detail is absolutely flawless. And really, and I love Ed Cohen more, you know, more than anything. This dude, I'll think of it in a second, is by far the best of all time. Like he's just, raw has totaled 2,300. I mean, none of us have done that, not even Eddie. And so, uh, but this dude's attention to detail is perfect. When American, you have all these really popular Instagram famous powerlifters and you watch yeah. the move and it makes me so mad because it's so terrible and i'm like man get off instagram and go you know go see squat university and learn to lift and you'll be, maybe you'll beat this russian guy who's you know two weight glasses below you you know and then you can talk but like yeah i, I think where the magic of being a great lifter is finding that connection between right. wanting to be perfect but also knowing you need to push your body in that at our highest level lifts, they're not always going to be perfect. There's going to be small, you know, I shifted a little bit or I caught it just a little bit off balance. And that's okay. Know that it's on a max lift. But yeah. if we have that approach for every single lift, like 30, 40, 50% on up, we're approaching the barbell to make a great, perfect looking lift every time. That will bleed over into the way in which we're taking that 90, 95, 100% max effort. And when you can find that uh, sort of connection between pushing enough 
to where we're continuing to progress our weights, but reeling ourselves back in enough and having that desire to perform a perfect rep to where I'm not getting too sloppy with my working weights during training. I think that's where you find sort of the magic of being in perfecting our performance potential. Yeah. Yo, I want to, I want to, uh, rewind it just for a second. We, we didn't really introduce you to, to the audience and we haven't really got uh, any background. Uh, <laughs> right. I, I, for, for we don't need that to. Yeah, your your Instagram account is so popular. A lot of I people actually know, have most gone. Most people already know who you are. Yeah. So, I, I, but I do want to rewind just a minute and, and not only just hear your background, but I want to hear what it was like to, you know, go from just kind of being a regular dude to growing this big platform and, and this huge following and, and just what the ride was like. Yuri yeah. Belkin, by the way, just so no one. Okay. Okay. That's the we Russian go. power. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I say it. That drive me crazy. Last word. Go. Last word. All right. So, <laughs> so for those out there that don't know who I am, my name is Aaron Horshig. I'm a doctor of physical therapy and all around just strength nerd, I guess we'll say. Uh, my background is an exercise science undergraduate degree and then got my doctorate in physical therapy. Um, but ever before I got there, I was an Olympic weightlifter. So I started competing in 2005, uh, back when CrossFit was still in its infancy and we didn't really know what it was. Um, I was there in those days. Yeah. I was hanging out on the it, message boards. Oh yeah. Love yeah, so, that. so Truman State University, uh, a small school in northeastern Missouri, who uh, Travis knows, Dr. Alex Cook. Uh, That's my professor, his, too. His professor. Yeah. Uh, he was at Truman State, and he was our professor and our club coach for the Iron Dogs. Awesome and, guy. Uh, prior to that time, I had been exposed to weightlifting a little bit through high school, so I felt very uh, fortunate. I went to Eureka High School here in St. Louis, and my coach actually had bought a bunch of Aleco bars after the 96 Olympics, oh, so, what? In Atlanta, wow. so our high school had like 10 platforms, <laughs> a bunch of Aleco barbells. From like, Atlanta Olympics. Man. Yeah. <laughs> your high school. Because <laughs> after a lot you're of You're like those, Bill yeah. Gates having the internet just at your high school. <laughs> exactly. So God, I felt very fortunate. I started learning how to do cleans when I was like, I don't know, 13 years old or so. So when I got, I never really knew too, known too much about Olympic weightlifting competition wise, because back in the early 2000s, it was still very, a very you know, a very niche sport. It was very, you couldn't walk down the street and say, Hey, yeah. what's your clean and jerk to someone that looks athletic and they know exactly what you mean. So I got to college. I see the, you know, the Truman state iron dogs and they're like, Hey, uh, you know, we train all week long and then we compete sometimes on the weekends in weightlifting. And I'm like, sign me up. That sounds amazing. So instantly fell in love with the sport. And then when I got out through physical therapy school, I decided I sort of want to route my profession to where I'm helping other people like myself who always wanted to be a great weightlifter, but just always continuously experienced aches and pains. There's not a single weightlifter in the world that go through an entire year and something's not aching. There's, you know, a knee pain, a back pain, shoulder, because you're continuously pushing your body day in and day out because you love competing. So I thought, well, now that I have this background in weightlifting and now I have the knowledge and experience being a physical therapist, let me sort of combine the two. And it wasn't, I just didn't start speaking to the world early on. You know, I had a lot of years sort of in the trenches working with athletes, developing my own knowledge base because a lot of people don't realize like once you get out of school and you have your doctorate, that's your time to start learning really. You yeah. just got your diploma to start learning. Yeah. You don't. You don't know everything at all, and not that I know everything. I feel else. like that's the time you start debating Travis on Twitter. Yeah, exactly. exactly. That is not the time to start working. That is when you yeah. immediately start and talking. Get slaughtered smack. like all the rest of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 As soon as Twitter you get the piece of paper, yeah. go to Twitter. I shred so many early PTs. <laughs> it's sad. Like this one dude, I pretty much cut him in half and hung him out to dry. Like, Come on, man. Yeah. You can't debate me with your opinion. You don't coach anybody. I, I coach people, plus I have the research. You look like a fool, man. <laughs> anyway. Actually, Aaron, actually, I want to get your thoughts on that. Like, there's a part of the culture of physical therapy almost where it's like nothing is safe enough, almost. Like, where it, some people yeah. go way overboard. And it's like, it's nothing but like, but like rotator cuff exercises and banded stuff and like squatting, anything bilateral is bad for this and bad for that. And it's like, yeah. this is a part of the culture at some level. Like, wh why do you think that that I, is still a thing? Yeah. I, d I definitely feel a little bit like the black sheep of the physical therapy world in that I was more of that strength conditioning realm, weightlifting realm before I entered the physical therapy profession. And like you said, Travis, like 
Twitter physical therapy world is just obnoxious <laughs> sometimes. I mean, I, I put up a, a tweet the other day and I was just like, you know what? <clears throat> As a physical therapist, chiropractor, athletic trainer, you're a medical provider. I believe it's a fundamental ability. You should be able to perform a great looking squat, deadlift, in a kettlebell swing, just basic fundamental movements. I'm not saying you have to be a world record or you need to be able to be in a powerlifting meet, but you should be able to show competency in basic loaded movements. And Twitter PT just blew up at me and was basically saying like, oh, you know, just because I didn't tear my ACL doesn't mean I can't treat people with ACL tears or- Yeah, you know, probably just does. Sound like that, yeah. yeah um, so. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. But yeah. as far as the physical therapy profession, you sort of see different realms of things. You see some people that don't understand loaded movement. They don't understand what the body is capable of. I yeah. would um, make an analogy of if you're in the NASCAR or Formula One world, you don't get a mechanic that works at Jiffy Lube to work on your car. Well, a lot of the physical therapists in the world today are mechanics that work at Jiffy Loop. They do a great Seriously. job with your regular, normal aches and pains, but they don't understand really how that translates into a high performance machine, which is an athletic body. And every single person should have the capability to perform basic uh, movements loaded, like a squat or a deadlift. And I think the reason that we have such an issue with like, and this is obviously getting off on a tangent, but I mean- No, it's think not, about, this is beautiful. Think about every single Perfect. one of our grandparents. <laughs> how many of our grandparents can squat all the way down body weight and just sit in the bottom of the deep squat. Mm. How many of our grandparents struggle? If you were to say, hey, here's a 50 pound box. Can you put this on a high shelf? Grab it down low, hinge well, <laughs> pick it up and put it onto a high shelf. And it's because we've approached so many of these different things of like deadlifting and squatting. We think it's an exercise movement first that only people do for athletic pursuits. And we don't understand that that's it's it's a fundamental thing. It's life. Being able to do a squat is not an exercise first. It's a fundamental movement. Being able to hinge and grab something and pick it off the ground, that's a deadlift. That's a basic fundamental movement that you should have competency to be able to load. And when you do it, translates over to much more than just athletic performance, but it creates a fundamental uh, baseline of movement that translates over to the way in which you're going to live the rest of your life. Aaron, can you believe me? Believe that this guy was like trying to tell me, you know, I have my son Rock doing – you know, some weightlifting and he's, yeah. he's really good. And like this guy's love, trying to tell me about those the, videos. By I the love thing. it. And he's trying to tell me about the growth plates. And I'm saying, are you referring to the epithelial line? That one, the one yeah. who's really good at taking vertical forces, that one, the one that's not very good at horizontal or torsion, that guy, cause I know all about it, man. And it's very good vertically. And you that's know? such, that's such an old myth that My lifting God, is bad yeah. for kids. I mean, so, all right, I've tried. Oh, I use your stuff too, by the way, to argue with the guy. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Well, yeah. like, you know, people, people will say it about weightlifting, but nobody says it about gymnastics. I was you know, just like, that's a big dog always. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, and then like, look it, at the look at the epidemiological studies that of injury risk. Gymnastics <laughs> has such a high more injury risk. Oh, than yeah. It does. It's mm -hmm. crazy. And, Whenever you look at the actual, I love gymnastics. By the way, for anyone that thought I was dogging on gymnastics, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I wish I could do what some of those like nine-year-old yeah. girls do when they're doing L-sit rope or uh, rope climbs for yeah. multiple yeah. reps. You're like, hold on a second over there, girl. What are you doing? Whatever There's I want, she said. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm just climbing the rope, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> When you actually look at the research, you'll see that there's extremely low injury risk, especially to growth plates for young children weightlifting because they often have great coaching and they have people that are going to make sure that they're following the rules and not just horse playing in the weight right. room. If you look at the research, the number one injury sustained by children while lifting is because they drop stuff on their feet or their hands, right. not because they, you know, blew their, their ankle out or, you know, they have a growth plate fracture. Do you know how we sustain growth plate fractures? We play football, baseball, and basketball over and over yeah. and over again. And we're jumping right. the forces sustained on your growth plates during repetitive jumping. Cumulative is much more than doing a couple squats with some light weight. Yeah, I totally like agree. Deceleration that was I told and them. change of direction. Yeah. The forces exactly. on your knees are going to be so much higher than doing controlled squats. No doubt. Yeah. You know, I posted that video of like, you know, when I was debating this guy. So I took all these videos of, of little kids playing Pop Warner football, and little kids, you know, playing soccer. And I, and I was like, this is okay. And I had like, you know, where a kid's getting hit from the side and the knee, you know, laterally in the knee. And then another kid is uh, getting, you know, just getting tackled by a huge dude twice his size. I'm like, so this is okay. 
this these horizontal you know forces that's fine but me with this very controlled five kilogram barbell <laughs> that's dangerous there's no lo- there's no dang logic to that man like stop stop what you're doing and just don't get get off the internet and think about it for 10 yeah. seconds and you'll be like oh my god i'm an idiot that's what you'll say to yourself <laughs> and which, if, if you actually look at like all the medical associations out there that actually say that lifting is completely fine for kids it's astounding it's like every like single the mayo clinic medical, yeah yeah they say lifting is completely fine. fine as long as you're using appropriate loads great technique which sounds like the exact same recommendations for just lifting as an adult exactly <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that crazy like you know all sports should be able to be done at all ages you know safely yeah. and in the, with the proper loads that would be yeah. the only two things it's like i just don't understand how this thing got demonized but yeah so you have that side of the profession right we talked about that's just like doesn't understand high level athletics and just like if you have knee pain all right sit on the bed and do this little clamshell and let's do ice pack cold pack dry needling yeah. cupping and you know we don't understand movement we don't get people up in moving and squatting and single leg squatting and deadlifting in clinic. You know, those are things that we need to have as a part of our rehabilitation. If we're actually going to fully get people back to living a life that they need to be living. And then you have another side of the profession that basically doesn't believe that there's anything such as a, there's no bad movements. It's just the movement you're not prepared for. And to a point, I understand it, but uh, they're very big on like Jefferson curls. And not like a Jefferson curl, like let's stretch your low back, which I, that's another tangent, but loaded movement of the low back. And that is a big no, no. I agree 100%. You know, I, I'm, I'm with Stuart McGill and you yeah, on that. So definitely. I mean, there's a lot of research that shows us that loaded movement of the spine over time is what leads to the delamination of the disc and the eventual injury. Um, and it's, it's something that we need to teach people against. You know, it's whenever we're lifting big weight, we want to be able to stiffen the spine and move about the hips. Right. And, and that leads to uh, lower injury risk and improved performance. So we have two sides of, of the conversation whenever we're talking about lifting mechanics. And spine, the spine needs to be stiffened, and it does not, we do not want to see movement of the spine. Um, mm-hmm. I 100%. Can you dig into that? Because I actually feel amazing when I do Jefferson curls. I don't do them that heavy. I don't do them for a ton of reps. You're not not doing them heavy. Yeah, I just do them to like feel good. And they feel great. Like everything loosens up. I breathe. I mm -hmm. do all – it it just makes me feel good. And then we had Stuart on. He was like, no, no, don't don't do that. And now you're (laughs) saying, no, Anders, you're not that smart. Stop. (laughs) <laughs> let's, let's, let's dive, let's yeah. dive into the science of that. Yeah. So if we look at the spine, it's a very flexible rod. And Dr. Stuart McGill likes to use uh, the idea of like a, like a fishing rod, right? right? It should be very, very bendy. But in the same sense, uh, if we're trying to load the body and pick up weight, we want it to be stiffened so that it does not buckle. Yeah. So it has to be very bendy to be able to do, you know, to bend over, tie your shoes, to be able to extend back and put something on a high shelf, to be able to do any of the, you know, latest dance craze. Yeah. Um, your spine is, you know, <laughs> to, to be able to that. be on TikTok, right? You got to be yeah. able to do all these different If you're moves, doing the right? Bernie on TikTok, you exactly. need mobility. You've been killing TikTok. <laughs> I gave up I on appreciate TikTok. it. Yeah. I appreciate it. <clears throat> so again, whenever we uh, want to pick up a weight or place a load on the body, we want to limit movement of the spine. So the spine sort of lives by this equation of power equals force or load times velocity. Now, if you're performing something like a golf swing, we're having a lot of movement at the spine. Think of, imagine Tiger Woods uh, swinging a golf club. There's a lot of velocity at the spine, but there's very low load. I mean, the golf club he's lifting is not 10 pounds. It's a very, very light club. And if power is remained or kept at a very low level, um, the spine can remain very resilient. But what happens is that if we mix the two, velocity and load, things start to happen. So let's think about the power lifter now. He's trying to pick up 600 pounds. If he goes to pick up 600 pounds and he limits back movement, so he locks his spine in place and then moves about the hips, we have very low power because we have a lot of load. We have a lot of force on the spine, but there's very low velocity because anytime the spine is moved, there's velocity. 
Right. So if we have low power, the spine is able to maintain resiliency long term. And that's why you see a lot of very old power lifters who are, you know, extremely strong is because they've used good technique for such a long time. They can pick up 500 pounds at 80 years old. Right. You know what I'm that's saying? the goal. That's the goal. <laughs> what, happens, what, are, what are your thoughts on? Oh, sorry. I thought you were done. Go ahead. No, sorry. So whenever you mix the two. So if you're doing a deadlift in your back rounds, not starts in a slightly rounded position, but when it moves through more, moves more flexion. flexion. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Because We all just did it. I was the opposite. I'm like, no, I made my back hurt, so I went back. <laughs> so when we have movement, we have velocity and a lot of load. That is the injury mechanism that slowly delaminates the disc and leads to eventual things like disc herniations and plate fractures and things like that. So it's a power generation of the spine. Now, if you're talking about a very lightweight Jefferson curl, so for yeah. those out there that don't know what a Jefferson curl is, you basically start at the top and you are flexing, moving every single part of your spine all the way down. So it's like an RDL, but moving your spine. If it's very, very lightweight, which is what the Jefferson curl was intended to be. If you actually yeah. talk to people who do a lot of them, it's more of a stretch for yeah. the low back. So when you're doing that and you feel fine, is it the worst thing ever if the, if the load is kept low? Probably not because and you're the very speed much of it. A, and the speed of it because you're, very, you're kept under your current capacity. Yeah. But what happens if that, if you start going heavier and heavier, which some people have done, is that you're starting to increase the force. So you now have a lot more load times velocity so even if you're doing something that's very low velocity you're still having velocity and load you're increasing power generation so you're just increasing your risk of injury long term so if we're going to do a jefferson curl and it's just something that you enjoy doing you feel like the feel of it just keep it very very light i don't have a big problem with it now everyone's spine is different some people have a spine that's very bendy right we look at a, a yogi their right. spine is more like a willow branch and it can kinda bend like, and bend like all me. day long. Yeah. Exactly. Like Travis. Yeah. And then you have some people whose spine is basically like a thick branch. Yeah. And if it bends a lot, it starts to eventually, you know, right. find injury. So there's no set amount of reps or weight or bending that eventually leads to an injury in the spine, but the mechanism remains the same. So whenever we are talking about lifting mechanics, we want to, as much as possible when lifting load, maintain the stiffness of the spine and move about the hips. And what you'll notice also is that in doing so, if we're talking performance goals, you will have better performance power production out of your legs. Because as Stu says, core stability, proximal stability enhances distal athleticism and power. Right. And you can see this just very simply. Let's say you're doing a push press. Do one where you're just completely unbraced and then do a second one where you take a big breath into your stomach. You brace your core like someone's about to punch you in the stomach and Huge then difference. you go instantly. You feel this increase in power and strength Look, it's man, because you started from a solid foundation of course stability. That dude saved my life in 2004, early 2004. I was told that I was, I was close to paralysis. And so I was like, okay, it's time to retire. And I took one shot. I was like, let me just check out the Stuart McGill guy. Everyone talks mm -hmm. about and then, of course, later that year, I went on to break the world record. And then again in 2005. But it was definitely thinks, and I feel now I'm back is the last of my worries. Like, I never have back pain. It's definitely thinks, you know, just following his principles. He would definitely say, don't ever stretch the low back. You know, but, but you know, yeah. if you feel the need, I would, you know, go light. But he would say, if you want to move, move about the hips. And yeah, and, and the reason we say don't stretch the low back is because often when people are dealing with back pain, they feel like they need to stretch something yeah. because they get a little bit of instant relief. Now, the reason you do that is because when you're stretching your low back, like pulling your knees to your chest, you're actually activating stretch receptors deep within your muscles that change that brain-body connection, your sensation of pain. So you get a little bit of instant relief of pain. But what you're not doing is fixing the underlying whys. And a lot of people, especially strength athletes, we find pain because we are flexion intolerant. So bending right. loads leads to more and more pain. So just a simple test for those listening or at home watching this. If you were to sit straight up in a chair and then grab your hands underneath the chair and pull straight up with a good neutral posture and just pull straight up as hard as you can to try to smash your spine straight down, do you have any pain? Yes, no. Now slouch, round your back yeah. like crazy and pull up. Yeah. And a lot of people will then experience pain when their yeah. back is flexed, rounded, and sure. then they add that compression and load. They feel pain. 
Well, what that shows us is that your back is flexion intolerant. And I don't need to know 100% the specific anatomy underlying that is generating the pain, but I know from a movement perspective that flexion motion with load, which is you mimicking you know, by pulling up on the chair, that is leading to triggering your pain. So for you to pull your knees to your chest to actually stretch your low back, you're pulling into your exact trigger for pain which is why a lot of people will end up doing knees to chest. They'll feel like stretch. They'll feel better just for a slight amount. And then 30 minutes later, they've got knee pain again. Or some people, um, like I was talking to Brian Carroll, he would do, you know, he was like, well, I should do back uh, the hyperextension. Or That's the, what uh, I was going to ask hyper. you about. Can the you talk hyper. about that a little bit, the reverse hyper and what your thoughts are on yeah. that? So the reverse hyper, it's, if you talk to most in the powerlifting community, because Louis Simmons is just a, you know, a stronghold in that, they'll always say, oh, well, Louis did, you know, did the reverse hyper and it cured his back pain, so I got to do it too. That's all, first and foremost should be the first red flag. Just because something helped someone does not mean it's right for your <laughs> back because everyone's a little bit different. Unless everyone has the exact same injury and the exact same exactly. spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what does the reverse hyper do? Well, on the very bottom when your legs swing under, it provides a little distraction of the low back. And then when you kick up, there's a lot of engagement of the posterior chain, glutes and hamstring, and then the erectors of the, uh, of the low back. They're working to extend the low back. So you have sort of flexion with distraction and then extension. So you have a lot of muscles that are activating at the very top. For some people, this will help them. I'm not saying it's not a bad thing. Some people do find relief with this, but there are a lot of people that this could be one of the worst things for them. Yeah. And especially if someone is flexion intolerant, when they pull down under and you're getting that distraction at the very bottom, that's actually creating a trigger. Again, I talked to Brian Carroll doing the reverse hyper felt okay. 30 minutes later, he was on his stomach. He could barely even walk. Right. So for a lot of people, first and foremost, if you're dealing with back pain, the first thing you have to do is a proper evaluation to find your movement trigger, your individual reason for generating pain. And we need to then craft together a treatment program to address each one of those. And a lot of times it has to be for more of a stability emphasis, especially for a lot right. of strength athletes in doing things that help stabilize the spine. And then also addressing things like hip mobility and balances and things like that. So I think that the reverse hyper wall, it does have its place. I think it's definitely used as like a catch all machine. No when way. in reality, we need to first understand, well, why did my pain even start in the first place? What's my movement evaluation? And then crafting together a plan that addresses all those movement problems. That's how you get out of pain and you build back capacity and resiliency to get back to what you want to do. You know, and Stuart McGill, he, you know, he've, He's been to my gym or the one I sold in Louisville, um, and he showed us actually if you're going to do the reverse hyper, if it's something that can actually help you. Yeah. He showed us a technique where I definitely agree with what he said versus like you know Louis. And I'm not obviously everyone knows I I, I love Louis Simmons. Yeah. He's done probably more for the industry than anybody else, but it doesn't mean he's right about everything. And so like you know they'll purposely move into flexion extension flexion in in the torso while they're doing you know obviously with you know at the hip as well and so he you know Stuart taught me to be up on my forearms and to like lock down the scapula and to keep you know to brace around mm -hmm. with my spine as much as possible therefore getting the majority of the movement from the hips versus like from exactly the spine. exactly so that's something that like uh blaine sumner who yeah. most people know you know powerlifting world who's squatted over a thousand pounds i don't know he is a beast pounds. He's a beast. Yeah. When he does the reverse hyper, he props himself up. Basically, his pelvis is on the end of the yeah. pack so that so when do he does it, and he also does it in single leg too. And again, what you're doing there is limiting a lot of uh, twisting action as well. You're sort of bracing even more. And the load, so the of motion, course. Exactly. Yeah. The, the motion is being placed across the hips. Again, right. what we're doing with this is we're trying to mimic how we want to move whenever we're lifting weights. I don't want your back to move when you're lifting weights. I want you to stiffen your spine and then move about your hips. So the reverse yeah. hyper, if done in that manner, sort of structures the movement <clears throat> quality in that way. Yeah. A, well, a lot of this I, falls in yeah. line with Greg Cook's joint by joint concept. How, how much do you subscribe to that? What do you think the pros and cons are? And, and maybe give a brief explanation of, of how it works. Yeah. For so that aren't the, familiar. The joint by joint approach is probably one of the, the most impactful concepts that I have ever learned 
in my physical therapy and just strength and conditioning practice. So for those out there that don't know. Kinetic what chain, is that what we're talking about? The basically, kinetic. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so when we look at the body, and this is Greg Cook, strength and conditioning coach, Mike Boyle sort of wrote of this uh, a lot in the past, years and years ago. It's the idea of looking at the body as a linked system, like you mentioned, the kinetic chain, in that each joint or joint complex has a very specific role to play and connection with the rest of the body. So your feet, your feet are naturally some of the most mobile joint complexes in the entire body. There's many, many bones, muscles, ligaments all together. But technically, whenever we want to do any movement, we need that foot to become stable. When you walk and that foot hits the ground, it needs to all of a sudden become a stable structure for you to provide uh, basically a foundation for the rest of your body to move on top of. The next is the ankle. The ankle needs to be mobile. Now, obviously, there's some people that have hypermobility there, and we see a lot of issues with uh, sprained ankles and things, but for a large part, the ankle needs to be mobile and sometimes finds that it becomes sloppy and it becomes uh, stiffened eventually, it has a propensity to become stiffened. The knee needs to be very, very stable. The hips, sort of one and both, it has to be mobile and stable. The low back needs to be stable. The thoracic spine needs to be mobile. So you see this sort of connection yeah. up and down the chain of stable foundational structures in mobile joints on top. And what we find is that a lot of problems within the body can be related to how that joint disobeys that rule. So we find that the foot often, it, wants, it needs to be stable, but often what do people see issues with? It collapses over. It becomes unstable. The ankle, like I said, needs to be mobile, but it becomes stiff. The knee needs to be stable, but what do we find, especially like in weightlifters, it becomes unstable and caves in. Uh, the low back needs to be stable, but it has a propensity to being unstable and moving too much. So it allows us to understand sort of from a, you know, back off perspective, the different roles of those different body parts. And the reason that it's so helpful is not just to understand that, but to understand the connection. So the low back needs to be stable. Well, what's the joint above and below? They're very mobile joints. If you lose mobility at the hips, it directly impacts the stability of the low back. So for example, if someone's going into a deep reception of a clean and their low back loses stability. Now it may not be a huge cave over, but they've developed pain because we have small micro movements in the low back. Our first sense is, well, low back needs to be stable. Let's start doing some core work. But if we never look at the hips during our evaluation and find out that I'm missing 15 degrees of hip internal rotation on my right side, I'm never going to fully stabilize. I'm never going to provide full authentic stability to the low back because the next time I put myself into a position where I'm going to butt up against that hip mobility problem, the low back will compromise its stability. So stable structures will always break down in the presence of stiffness at joints that need to be more mobile. So that's why whenever we're talking about te fixing technique issues, we have to understand the connection between all different other, other parts of the body. So it's called regional interdependence. I don't like to use that fancy word because it just, you lose a lot of people right there. I don't want to use the ivory tower speak, but if I can say, hey, your knee bone's connected to your hip bone, people understand that, right? Oh, yeah. So when we're talking about fixing technique issues and or pain, it all makes sense because let's say I have someone with knee pain. The last thing I do is look at the knee. I look at everything else. I'm looking at the hip and I'm looking at the ankle and I'm looking at their feet. So if someone comes to me with knee pain, the first thing I say is get out of your shoes. Let me see a deep squat. Take off your shoes. Let me see a single leg squat. And I'm not looking to see if they can do a perfect astrograss pistol, but I'm looking for what the quality of their movement looks like. So if I have someone that has right knee pain and I tell them to do a single leg squat on the right side and instantly I see their foot caves over or maybe they can't get as far and then they have to lean to the side. Well, right there's a dead giveaway that they have a movement problem that's underlying that knee pain. So then I check it out, I take it down and I say, all right, well, let's do some breakout screens. Let's do a five inch wall test on each side, close chain ankle mobility. I wanna see how much your knee can go over your toes with your feet staying flat on the ground, which is a squat or a deadlift. So they get down there and they're five inches from the wall, they drive their knee over their toe and they see, all right, my left side can touch. My right side, oop, I'm about four inches away. Or I'm four inches forward. I, I'm missing about an inch of ankle mobility compared to my other side. Because again, I'm not looking for whether or not we have amazing mobility or not. But asymmetries and side-to-side -side difference in mobility 
what it does is it changes the way that your body is being moved. And when you place a load on your body time and time again with a movement problem, every single tissue in your body has a set biological load tolerance that it can tolerate before tipping into injury, before finding pain. So let's say you were missing that little bit of degree of ankle mobility on the right side. And we found out that was the only issue. Hips looked completely fine. Well, every single time you go down into a squat, all of a sudden you're shifting side to side a little bit. And maybe not even a big degree to the outsider's perspective. But when you're missing ankle mobility on one side, that knee joint all of a sudden is taking more load more quickly than the other side. So the tissues then around the knee become overloaded and eventually they slip into pain. Now, if I went to a physical therapist, chiropractor, you know, athletic trainer, and I say, I've got some knee pain, most of the time, the first thing they do is they look at the knee. They poke around the knee and they're trying to look at your quad and things like that. If they never look and address at that missing ankle mobility, while they may be able to take away your pain in the short term with whatever they're doing, some strengthening exercises, maybe they just tell you to stop squatting, right? So you take away the trigger for pain. Well, all of a sudden you're starting to feel a little bit better. Maybe they did some dry needling to that, that those specific tissues that were really inflamed and you're feeling better. Well, the next time you go back to squatting, if you didn't address that limited ankle mobility, now you're just pushing right up against that exact same problem that you were dealing with before. And you're, it's just a matter of time until you overload that area and eventually pain ensues again. And this is a good question for like weightlifters. And this is me being selfish. This is actually for my own team, but like, do you find that with weightlifting, you know, because it's so much overuse, it's like that people develop, you know, like not any, not any um, injuries, but like, you know, you get the, the common tendonitis or just, you know, is there anything within a program that you feel should be consistent pretty much throughout to help avoid that? I, I think there's, there's two things. First and foremost, I think single leg um, lifts as far as an assistant exercise Agreed. goes no, a long no. ways. Um, just doing some single leg squats. And I'm not saying pistol squats because you, you tell a power lifter to start doing some pistol squats and they look at you like you're speaking French. I'm saying, I'm saying like, a, like a touchdown squat. Like you're, you stack up a couple 20 kilo plates, you hinge at the hips, you have good stability, you're out of your shoes, you tap your heel down to the ground like you're tapping an eggshell, you're not breaking the egg, you come back up. Do 15 of those, two sets. Your glutes are going to be burning. You're working on your knee control. You're working on your foot stability. And all of a sudden, adding in that single leg work not only is going to expose if, uh, deficits side to side uh, in your ability to control your body, but it sort of allows you to work on making sure that those imbalances that often occur because we're always on two legs, they're not going to get big enough to where they yeah, create great. I mean, what a, about pistol squats? You yeah. know, like, I mean, I have a lot of weightlifters, you know, who are amazing. So yeah. like Ryan, you know, Ryan Grimslin, he's going to be able to do pistol squats all day. So like, yeah. is that, should, is that something we should do? I don't think it's necessarily something you have to do, but what I'm looking for more so is the control. So for, for example, I love doing me personally before squats, I'm going to do two sets of maybe five to eight reps of a single leg squat just off of a bench. So a bench is what, 18, 20 inches high? Just down, tap, and back up. And I'm just working on the control. I know I have the depth to do a full pistol squat. But what I'm looking control. for is just to work on solidifying Tempos. the control yeah. of the body, tempo, exactly. And whether or not there's a different side to side. Because if I can be like super wobbly on one side and the other side feels solid, what do you think is going to happen to my body if I get under the load and now I'm yeah. placing all, you know, increased weight on my body? If I'm imbalanced side to side in my control or my mobility prior to lifting, you know, that's just going to be overcomplicated. The more yeah, this is on my body. brilliant. You, you mentioned doing it out of shoes. Is that something weightlifters uh, should be doing shoes. frequently is getting yeah. out of their lifting shoes and, and lifting barefoot? Get out barefoot. of your weightlifting shoes as yeah. much as possible. Now, certain gyms <laughs> have certain requirements and certain gyms won't allow you to be barefoot. Uh, Mine those does. Are not my, yeah, those, I don't like those gyms. So uh, yeah. if you can't go <laughs> find a new gym. But if you can be barefoot, be barefoot as much as possible. The thing with shoes, most shoes are very, very narrow. And if you're like, oh, well, the Nike 2s are wide toe box. No, they're not. Most shoes that we wear today are extremely, extremely narrow. What they do is they jam your big toe into the rest of your body. And if you actually, I mean, try this right now. If you jam your toes together and then try to move your foot side to side, so pronation, yeah. supination, you'll find that your foot will actually pronate a good amount if your big toe's jammed in. 
But mm. spread your toes out like crazy, like your foot was designed. If you look at a baby's foot, the big toe is really, really out to the side. Yeah. The toes are the widest part of the foot. And then from there, keep your toes wide and now try to pronate your foot over. Okay. And it won't go. It's because your foot is designed to be a very stable structure, but the toes have to be in a good place. Increase the look, moment of inertia yeah. is what you're doing. I see I'm a you know. barefoot guy. I'm yeah. walking around the neighborhood barefoot all the time. I have the most jack feet in the yeah. whole joint, the whole area code. <laughs> Yeah. And people look at me like, I'm nuts. <laughs> like so, two, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, Doug. I was, I was going to say, do you think it's beneficial to have like toe spreaders that you wear when you're barefoot that, that push your toes apart? Oh, oh, you got it right there. The dude has them on the desk. <laughs> I, pr I promise I clean these before I set them up. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give, I'll these, give you guys these, two, two these bits are of correct advice. Toes. From because of, of Aaron, you know, I, I started squatting barefoot and it was a huge difference. And then I took my son Rock out of shoes and started having him do his weightlifting, yes. you know, barefoot. It has been the biggest, I didn't, it, it takes away me having to cue so many things. Like, automatically, he started getting it when he went barefoot for some reason, whether it was, you know, you have the, you know, a ton of receptors on the bottom of your foot. Mm -hmm. You do. Whatever, yeah. neurologically, it totally changed the way he did lifting and, and his old man dad. I mean, I'm not as good as he is, but <laughs> like, uh, it definitely helps. So it's, it's a definite it's a, um, win for people. I've been squatting barefoot for the past year now, and I can't tell you how much better my technique feels yeah. because I'm allowing my body to feel the ground. I mean, we always say grab the ground with your feet, feel the movement that's occurring. And when you're out of your shoes – you can feel every tiny movement. Yeah. And when we're talking about squatting, any movement that's occurring at the feet has an up the chain response. Right. So if that foot collapses over whenever you're ascending out of a squat, your knee is starting to shift in that amount, yeah. which then changes your hip that amount, which then changes your back that amount. So if yeah. I can sense that from the very beginning, I can work against it and to that's build a stable brilliant. foot. Yeah, so the correct toes, like you said, Doug, <clears throat> there's a couple different products on, on the market, but correct toes is the one toe spreader, to my knowledge, that is meant to be worn while you move. It's not meant to be like something you like wear like while you're sleeping. And the reason for that is because we often think about our oh, foot stability. I got to do a bunch of these little like physical therapies, you know, toe scrunches and foot drills. No, you need to put your foot into the proper alignment the way your foot was designed toes in the I widest position and then you just need to move yeah you need to, you i need to my that. whole uh oh, life changed when i broke my big toe and trained through it instead of letting it heal properly and oh. i developed one of the most beautiful hip shifts you've ever seen in your life because i couldn't it like my ankle stopped going where it was supposed to go. The knee stopped going where it was supposed to go. Everything yep. shifted over to the left side. And it was all because I trained through and just basically taped my toe up, um, blocked that entire side from moving properly. And next thing you know, two years later, I just had a problem that was almost, I mean, I could fix it if I put the time into it, but it was like, eh, this is too big of a problem. I'm just going <laughs> to back the weights down. I don't need to do this anymore. And what was the other thing for, you said there was two things for the, for the weightlifter. You said the, the single leg squat. Yeah. I, I feel like it'd be great for weightlifters to do just general self maintenance or self checks of their mobility, doing okay. simple things. And these are things that I share all across social media for free. Like if you look on my video on YouTube, how to fix a hip shift, yeah. there's a test called yeah. Remember that one I sent yeah, you? Yes. So what is it? You're just laying on your back, side yeah. to side, let your hip fall out. And what we're looking for is, is there a difference side to side? Is there a big mobility imbalance? It's because like I mentioned, as a weightlifter or a power lifter, we are always on two feet. We're never doing things single leg. So if there's an imbalance side to side in mobility, it, it means that you while you're lifting and while you're loading your body, you are asymmetrically loading your, one part of your body. And while your technique may look adequate to an outside observer, there's small things going on deep within right. your body that over time lead to those small aches and pains. I'm not talking like you're going to tear your ACL in weightlifting. That's an extremely, extremely rare thing. But what happens is that we have these small aches. My, my left yeah. knee sort of bugging me, my right hip. And it's because of these small movement issues. Like I mentioned, the last year I've been squatting without shoes. I haven't had a lower body issue in the past year. And for, gosh, all my years of squatting before that, maybe every couple months, just something would be a little bit achy. My right lateral hip, maybe my left knee. 
you know, something would just feel a little bit achy and I would do different things to work on it. But really because I was able to expose, there was a lot of stability issue and it wasn't like, I wasn't showing drastic knee cave, but right. just the smallest micro movements over time lead to macro trauma. That's the, sort of the idea behind this movement based approach. Dang. My you're wearing, you're wearing your correct toes while you're squatting also. Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Now it's because I'm not wearing weightlifting shoes. If I, when I'm ready to do cleans and snatches, they won't fit in a weightlifting shoe or it'll be extremely uncomfortable. So I am then taking them off, put on my regular socks and, and, uh, and squat. What about so you think that's flexing? a good model for weightlifters? Is you, you wear your shoes for snatches, clean and jerks, and then when you squat, take them off. Oh, I, 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 I would question. say, I would say, yes. I think there's a couple things that, that go with that as a weightlifter, your goal with the squat is to be an assistant exercise yeah. for your clean and your snatch. It is not a competition lift. It is there to support your full lift. So the way in which you squat supports your snatch and your clean. So you should be squatting the exact same way you want to be hopefully cleaning or snatching in meaning that you want to squat to the same depth. If you squat just a parallel as an Olympic weightlifter, I don't think you are optimizing your strength and your movement quality for the clean. If you can sit in a full ass to grass deep back squat and do pauses down there and strengthen your, your uh, capacity in that deep position, you're going to see that carry over and solidify right. into a better clean reception because you've been in that position. You have the capacity down there. So especially the have, front squat, I would say is exactly so identical much, much more. Clean. Right. Yeah. So if you uh, are an Olympic weightlifter and you have the mobility to get down there, Yes, I think squatting barefoot could be amazing. Um, there are some people that need the assistance of a weightlifting shoe, and they can't squat deep without a lot of technique errors. So I, I don't think it's a yes or no. I think there's a lot of, a lot of blend, uh, sort of gray area. And then some people will find that when they're barefoot, they don't lift as heavy, especially early on because they're getting used to the weightlifting shoes. Um, but I'll say this, when I talked to Chris Duffin on my own podcast, who just recently squatted a thousand. Yeah. For we taught him too. He's to awesome. Him. Yeah. So Chris always says that the reason he squats barefoot is because it is a technique enhancer, a performance enhancer. Yeah. Like I mentioned, because it allows you to feel every single, uh, change in your stability from the ground up. So in that sense, you know, I, I think it'd be interesting to see more weightlifters squat barefoot and then put their shoes on only for their main. Get legs. ready. You're about um, to see a bunch of them. I would like to see, and I would challenge anyone that works for a major shoe company to come out with a truly wide toe box weightlifting shoe. Um, right now, the, like if you do want a wide toe box shoe, the Barefoot Athletics Ursus, which, uh, you know, is sort of a, a side business of Kabuki Strength with Chris Duffin, it's a flat sole shoe. But it, it, it has a super wide toe box. It's not, it's not an elevated heel uh. yet. But uh, yeah, there is not a single weightlifting shoe on the market that is truly natural, like a wide like enough a toe box, really like a foot. I mean, it's going to look weird at first because it's going to look almost like a clown shoe because it's so wide. Don't you kind of want that extra stability? It's kind of like, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like wearing a weight belt, but around your feet, like to keep so everything... You want tighter, the more stable. You want the, you want the stability in yeah. your in your heel and maybe even a little bit into the back part, the cup area, but you want those toes to splay out. And actually, gotcha. what you'll find, like I mentioned, if you pinch your toes together and then allow your foot to sort of collapse over, by having such a tight foot, you don't even realize it's going on, but your foot is easily unstable. Uh, what much about more unstable? What about I actually have noticed flexion? that I've rolled my ankle oh. running with shoes that are too small. Like if I, if I order like a 10, but it fits like a nine and a half or something, I will roll my ankle immediately when I go for a run on those shoes yep. because they're so tight and, and it takes away every, all of that kind of ground surface. It just, it feels awful and, and I end up getting hurt. It's interesting. What about that, Aaron? Like knee flexion, you know, like yep. I know because most weightlifting is done, you know, with, it's all knee extension, of course. And so the, we, we hardly, most people do zero like knee flexion, like leg curls or anything. Yep. Do you find that that might alleviate, you know, the imbalances at the knee? I don't know if we necessarily need to do more assistant exercises on machines, but as far as knee flexion, if you're doing a, you know, a single leg squat, like I mentioned off a box, just called a touchdown. And for anyone listening that wants to get, just get a visual of this. Um, if you go on 
just squat university's youtube and type in like how to pistol squat i have a full progression that sort of demonstrates the exact technique of this um but the idea is that you're using the body through a full range of flexion and extension. So that's why I love the, the touchdown squat. Right. I mean, what about strengthening though? The only thing is that we do so much to strengthen the quad quadriceps, mm -hmm. but we don't do anything that, you know, to necessarily to strengthen the hamstrings, especially okay, okay. as it, as it is, as it crosses the knee, you know, like, you know, the quads, anterior hamstrings, posterior. Yeah. And so we do zero, you know, either, I guess you could say the RDL, but not as it is, as it's shortening and increasing strength at the knee. I, I really think if you come from a, a good quality of movement uh, in looking at bilateral and single leg movements, and right. you're looking at the squat, you're looking at hinging motion, so we're looking at the RDL, the good morning. I think in Bulgarian split squat, I think yeah. if you're doing double and single leg movements in all of those realms, I don't think you necessarily need to supplement with okay. more things like a hamstring curl I, because I think it's, I, I don't like to think movement or muscles, I think movements. So that's, right. a, that's a big thing is when we're talking about specific muscles, a lot of people are like, well, this is a, a quad exercise or this is a shoulder exercise. No, it's a, it's a push. It's a press. Right. Body, bodybuilders train muscles because their, their end goal is to create form or essence. Right. They're trying to build the muscles very specifically. So they love to use different exercises that are able to isolate specific muscle groups. And not to say that bodybuilders don't have, you know, push pull days or squat or deadlift, but as a whole, the end goal of being a bodybuilder is to build aesthetics and to form the body totally. to have a certain look. Whereas as an athlete, it all comes down to movement. It what about quad ham imbalance? Even that, I, I really that, think is that garbage. I th I really think it's it's basically looking at the body through a microscope rather than taking a step back. Because I think sometimes mm. again we, we have this idea of uh, of looking at the body and trying to analyze and and be really really close and trying to focus our camera. Yeah. But in reality, we just need to take a step back and look at things. Because yeah. I promise, if you see these people that they'd say, oh, their their quad hamstring ratio is off, but really when you watch them move, oh. They can't even do a single leg squat on without falling over. Well, mm. don't fix the quad hamstring ratio with different isolated exercises like a seated knee extension or a quad or a hamstring curl. Fix their squat, and in doing so, that hamstring ratio, quad hamstring ratio, will be where it needs to be for that person. Totally. Part of the idea of like whenever you see a great looking athlete, uh, Lu Zhaojun, right, one of the greatest weightlifters right now, dude looks like a bodybuilder. He right. doesn't do bodybuilding. Now, yes, he, you'll see him doing like some rows and stuff like that every once in a while. But the majority of his training is weightlifting movements. And it appears as if he has done bodybuilding because he is training movements very well. He does quite a bit. I saw him in the training. <laughs> he, I, no offense. He's doing some dips <laughs> that all dude, the time. They, they, he they literally do, they does do a lot, lot of assistant work, but as far as the, the, the majority of their yeah. work, totally, I totally yeah. agree with you. But like when they go in the back, they do a lot more assistance than anyone in the world. Like they get right. They'll do their mm -hmm. awesome snatch, clean jerk, and then those dudes will spend some quality time. They got nothing to do. I what mean, else are they gonna do? Well, if I look like Lou, you're living with like five hundred <laughs> dudes in one big dorm room. You might as well go get your pump on all day. Lou will never mm -hmm. go broke because all he has to do is get naked and he's getting paid. You know, so like, <laughs> I don't, keep doing it, Lou. Keep, keep doing what you're doing. So. Um, I love that you've had this. Uh, you keep you. You haven't said anything about a lacrosse ball, and you haven't said anything about like banded distractions in the whole hour plus we've been hanging out. And when you we just mentioned kind of looking at the macro movements and all yeah. of that stuff figuring itself out, where do you stand kind of on those? I hope we've gotten a little bit away from it as, as a whole of I'm going to jam this lacrosse ball into the most painful spot on my knee and hang out here for the next five minutes until the pain goes away. Um, have we gotten away from that and started to realize there's, there's probably a little bit better way? It's all about having the right tool in the toolbox, but understanding the greater work at hand. And I'll give you an example. Let's say I have an athlete who's having a problematic squat and maybe they're shifting to one side or their hip hurts. I break them down. I know there's a movement issue. I see them shifting. When I break down their body and I do some testing and I see, oh, they're missing hip internal rotation on their left side. Well, if it's, if it's on their back and I'm raising their leg and, and internally rotating and they're missing a lot of movement and maybe that pain's on the front side of their body like a hip impingement, 
a banded joint mobilization for a hip impingement is amazing. So I get the band, we're doing a band joint mobilization, driving the knee out to the side, squeezing the glute, coming in, sort of gapping that hip joint. Well, we go and retest. And we retest and we see, oh, we were able to improve that range of motion, no longer has that pinch sensation right there. We're more symmetrical, awesome. That banded joint mobilization played a great part at fixing the underlying asymmetry hip mobility. Mm -hmm. Now, if I just leave it at that, I only did part of the work. I have to go back and look at the squat again. Yeah. Because I have, it all comes back to movement. And then I have to then load the squat well. And sometimes, it, depending on their, where their pain's at, because they've really irritated their hip, they may have to do a box squat early on. Or maybe it's just lightening the load but, or working on you know, engaging the lateral hips. <clears throat> the big thing is with, when we're looking at any type of mobility tool, it all has to fit within our underlying why of coming back to the macro, coming back to the movement. So there's nothing wrong with using a lacrosse ball into the hip. But your first question should not be why or, you know, how long should I do this? It's why did this area yeah. even become tender in the first area or in the first reason? <clears throat> if I'm doing it, let's say my glutes just really, really flared up one day and you take the lacrosse ball to it and it feels better. And then you just go throughout your day, go throughout your workout and you never Isn't try it? to get under. Yeah. yeah. And you never try to fix why did that even get there in the first place? You're not curious. You're not asking more questions and doing more testing that stiff area is going to continue being stiff and it's going to continue yeah. coming back. And eventually it may lead to something even bigger. So it all stems from understanding the movement perspective. Yeah. Yes. Those things have a place. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Kelly Starrett was one of the first people to start showing, Hey, we can do this banded yeah. traction using this little crossbow. It's yeah. amazing because it allowed I people. Love Kelly. I love Kelly. I don't Kelly think Kelly's, too. I don't think Kelly's the problem. I think Not all the people all. that tried to beat Kelly at being Kelly turned into a crazy exactly. one exactly because what kelly always said was test retest it is the yeah. ultimate understanding of you need to be empowered to take control of your body and here's some different tools now i've just sort of built on top of that and said here's the right he said here's the tools test retest but then let's bring it back and understand okay well why did he even get there yeah. in the first place so let's try some of these other tests too to understand how does that relate back to our movement because yeah. i don't want you to just feel good today and to take this pain away today I want you to fix why that pain was even there in the first yeah. place so that you can get back to performing at a high level and do so for the rest of your life. And I feel like those are things people think that pain are medical conditions, that that achy knee, that that's a medical condition. No, it's not. It's something that you should be empowered as an average everyday yeah. gym goer. You should have the power to understand how to take the first steps to addressing every single one of those aches and pains, yeah. which is why I put out so much content on just being like, hey, back pain, try this test. What'd you find? Okay. Do this exercise. See how this fits into your training program. This is something that you should be able to take control of yeah. because too often today we're just suffered with so much bad information out there. We're told by some people that pain is an inconvenience to life and we need to alleviate it, right? We need to cover it up. We need to put icy hot on. I need to buy these knee sleeves. Then you get the other side of things where it's like, Hey, that lifting you're doing, that's bad for you. Just stop lifting so much. Yeah, you know, yeah. we're not given great advice. So what I wanted to do with Squat University was basically be that voice of reason and say, hey, I'm a weightlifter too. I know what it feels like to have this achy knee and how frustrating it is to go through your training and be, you know, not being able to do what you want performance wise. There is a better option than what you're told today. You don't just have to yeah. ask your gym buddy, hey, what'd you do for your knee pain? There is a better option, and is that your new yeah. book? That what is, is your new book about? Yeah, it's hold it's, on. It's, can we do? Can, I have a, I have one oh question. I want yeah, to do the I want to do the whole book. I yeah. I'm really interested uh, in in like a very controlled setting. Do you ever like uh, I guess bring kind of the vestibular system into? I wanted to ask this when you were talking about getting your yeah. feet onto the ground and. You know, getting people moving with their eyes closed is something that I, I used to do just as like a trick, just to kind of take yeah. people's brains away from like the kind of that just, I know how to squat and you go, oh, really? Well, let's close your eyes and see what it looks like and see how the, how the body's wired and those movement patterns. And then really forcing people to connect their brain to their feet and understanding how far those messages have to travel in order for all the neurological components to actually make sense and turn into a beautiful looking squat. When you're in a controlled environment in the clinic, um, do you work with the vestibular system much? Everything that I'm doing technically has a vestibular aspect yeah. to it because it's your body's awareness. 
a lot of times we develop these aches and pains, not because we are weak, but because we don't have awareness of the way in which we are moving. So for example, that's why whenever I'm squatting, I'm getting people out of their shoes. Um, whenever maybe I'm doing a single leg squat, I'll have yeah. a band just pulling slightly in, sort of pulling them into a valgus. Yeah. That's called reactive neuromuscular training or RNT. And it's based on the principle that I don't want to just show you how to squat or tell you, keep your knee out. I want you to feel yeah. the problem occurring. I want you to feel and become aware of the movement problem because once you become aware, then you can fix it. A lot of people, and this is a big thing, especially with people in pain, when you have back pain, you, uh, there's a lot of research that shows that you automatically lose sensation and positional awareness of your spine. So you don't even realize that you're rounding your spine or letting it move as much as it really is because pain is inhibiting your sensation, your awareness of your body. So a lot of the things that I do is to bring awareness to that. So uh, sometimes you'll see, I love using this new exercise for, for back pain patients where I have just a bamboo bar on your back. And you can do this with a regular barbell, but take like 10 pounds, 10, 15 pounds, not a lot of weight and hang it off one side of the bar. It'll like with a, a very light resistance band. So it's sort of bouncing. Yeah. Just unrack it. And again, 10 to 15 pounds. So not much weight, but act like it's 300 pounds or 400 pounds. Cause when you stand up, if you're not braced properly, boom, that yeah. bar's just going to flip learn. on you. You'll learn very quickly. And then just take 10 steps back and 10 steps forward. And that bouncing weight creates a positional awareness within your spine because you have these very, very small muscles deep within your spine that actually have, they're very, very highly innervated. There's a lot of uh, muscle spindles that can sense positional change. That multi are you talking about the multif multifidine? Multifidine, and there's a lot of very, very small muscles that actually are sort of inter in between each and every single one of the, the different uh, vertebra. Right. So it allows you to become aware of these small little micro movements within your spine. You do right. that down and back a couple times, man, you feel like you have a sheet of armor across your back and across your core when you're done wouldn't that help your qls as well i mean like you know a little bit yeah on the opposite side is going to have to like shorten to stabilize and that's a great reason for doing like suitcase carries and things yeah. like that and a lot of people they say oh my ql is weak or my ql is tight that's just a response to something happening much deeper within right. the spine your ql is there to help stabilize your spine so when you're doing a suitcase carry and you're marching Let's say you're in right leg stance. So your left leg is swinging forward. Your left QL is cinching your pelvis to your spine. So it's right. making sure that your pelvis stays level to allow your leg to swing through. So a suitcase carry is a great uh, core stability exercise, a functional Agreed. exercise, because it, yes, it's training your QL, but it's not training it in a way like, oh, I need to do some side bends. So it's, yeah. again, it comes down to, are we training muscles or are we training movements and in doing the movement training if we're doing it correctly those muscles are getting worked but it's doing so in a way that's going to transfer over to the way in which your end goal better quality movement yeah beautiful tell us about the book <laughs> yeah I, we really could yes. go more if you we could sit here all day i could go all day i still have a list of questions <laughs> <laughs> so, so the book is called rebuilding milo so as for most people out there in the strength community, you've probably heard the name Milo before. Uh, Milo uh, was an ancient Greek Olympian, considered by many to be one of the greatest athletes of his time. Well, as the story goes, Milo lifted a small calf to his shoulders every single day. And as the calf grew in size, so did Milo's strength until one day he was ah. lifting a full-grown, you know, 1,500-pound bull. Bull. So the story set the precedent for modern day view of periodization with the emphasis progressive on progressive overload. overload. And I first yeah. learned about this from Dr. Alex Cook back in college. Brilliant. So the idea behind it is that every single one of us are trying to become our own version of Milo, but yet we often disobey this scientific code that you have to have sufficient uh, stress on the body and adaptation or uh, in recovery for adaptation to occur. You can't just lift, 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 lift. You have to stress the body, you have to recover, and then adaptation can occur. And in our own pursuits of becoming our own version of Milo, we disobey this code, whether or not we're lifting too much, uh, inviting in um, you know, poor technique, 
things happen whenever we push the envelope. It's a double-edged sword because that, you know, that same drive within us to put 10 more pounds on the bar, to do one more set, to lift one more kilo on the platform. In our own pursuits of performance, we always sort of end up with these aches and pains. And in today's society, like I mentioned, we're not really given great advice about how to take the first steps to fix things. You either get the no pain, no gain. Oh, it's normal to have back pain when deadlifting. You deadlifted 600 pounds. Of course, your back's going to hurt a little bit. Yeah. Or you go see someone that says, just stop lifting so much. Or like the modern, med I mean, watch TV for five minutes nowadays. You're going to see some, you know, non-steroidal, anti-inflammatory, some pain cream. You're going to see so you're going to see Shaq touting icy hot or something like that, right? <laughs> so we're given such bad advice about how to create uh, a great, you know, room to, to make changes. So the idea behind the book is to say, I, there is a better way. And it's taking the right approach of understanding that we can screen the body, find these movement issues and take the right steps to get out of pain. Sweet. Um, so it walks you through every single common ache and pain and a strength athlete would have. Any single person that walks in the weight room is going to want to have this in their library because we're never always 100% healthy. I, mean, like I mentioned I've had knee pain. I've had back pain. I know what it feels like. And it's frustrating to not have the answers. Well, this is your first step. This is your first approach to understanding and fixing that. So chapter one is back pain. And you turn to it. That day you sort of have a little ache and pain. You go to back pain chapter and you open it up and it takes you through and you say, hey, here's some different reasons people develop back pain. Because there's not a one size fits all. There's many different reasons people develop pain. And it walks you through these different, a back, you know, a disc herniation, an end plate fracture, facet joint irritation. And then it says, you know what? You don't have to have Dr. Stuart McGill or Dr. Aaron Horshig in your pocket to, to take you through and know exactly what specific anatomical structure is causing your pain because you can do a movement-based screen on yourself. That's so try these different things. Try the Faber test, like I sent you, Travis, yep. right? Do this. What did you find? Well, based on these tests, your symptoms fit within this sort of category. Right. Which empowers, an asymmetry. You, yeah. empowers you to take control of your body because it's not all in your head. There's a reason for your pain. And I can show you with a great evaluation, your specific movement trigger. And then based on that, it tells you, okay, try these exercises, do this specific thing for here, do this specific thing for here. And in doing so, it gives you a path that you can take to get out of pain and then build back a resilient body. So for back pain, I, not only do I want you to get out of pain, but then how do you get back into lifting? Because the last time you did cleans, things hurt. Well, let's take this bridge to performance. Let's start off with maybe doing some cleans from a high box in powers. So it takes you through how you can then eventually get back to lifting without pain. So you can build a body oh, of yeah. resiliency. So my, my whole thing was I wanted to write a book for 18 year old Aaron who had hip flexor pain or knee pain. And I was just like, what do I do? It's just, it's frustrating because I've got this big competition in 10 weeks and I don't just want to stop training, but I'm getting all this bad advice. If I could take that book off the shelf and try the tests, maybe I would have been able to do much better at that competition. Cause I would have only had to take two weeks of a small step back to fix the issue and then get on with what I would love to do, which is lifting heavy ass weight. So that's why I wanted to write the book to basically give everything that I tell people in a 480 page book. Well, this is a big, a big book. That means you wrote like 800 pages. I wrote a lot. I wrote a lot, but there's, there's a lot that goes into it because it's, it can't be a simple solution. Yeah. It's, it's a long discussion. There's a lot of things to consider because there's no one size fits all. If you're looking for a solution where it's, well, we all do this, that's the wrong book because everyone's got a little individual difference. You and your buddy may both have back pain from deadlifting 600 pounds, but it may be due to very different reasons. One person may have an instability within the spine. The other person may be very strong within their core, but they have a big hip mobility imbalance. And until you uncover that problem with proper screening, you'll never know. And your solution to fixing will never be as optimal as it can be. You know, talking to a lot of strength athletes, they're like, well, when my back hurts, I, I just take uh, a month or two off after competition. <laughs> and then eventually I'm able to get back into it. Well, that's You're not great. winning then, bud. You, yeah. you calm down your symptoms. You wound them down. 
but you're going to go back into the ring and get punched again, things are going to start aching up again. Right. I want to build a, I want to build resilient athletes. I want to empower and create educated athletes and coaches who can take the first steps at addressing these common aches and pains because they're not a medical problem. You don't have a torn ACL. You don't have, you know, something that's leaving you crippled on the ground that you need medical assistance right now. These are things that you should be able to take the first steps to fixing. If you don't address you it, know you very well could though. If you don't nip it yeah. in the bud, that will yeah. be the next step. Because if you have constant injury, in my experience, almost 100% leads to you know a real issue that you're going to have. You have no choice. Exactly. You'll be getting yeah. in the MRIs next. So exactly. So this is this should be the first step for people to educate yeah. themselves, become an educated consumer. So that if you do want to work with a chiropractor, athletic trainer, physical therapist, a doctor, you can have that conversation and say, well, I read this book and Aaron said that I, my knee pain is not tendinopathy. It's really a biomechanical issue because I have limited ankle mobility on one side and I have poor stability when doing a single leg squat. What do you think? Well, because so often we get people, and I can't tell you the amount of times I've heard this story of they had knee pain, so they went to a doctor. Doctor didn't even touch their knee asked him about what was hurting, wrote him a prescription for 800 milligrams, you know, milligram of ibuprofen twice a day, and then told him to stop squatting for two weeks. Mm. And then they're like, that, that's it? That's the solution? You know, or they go to a doctor that says, okay, Jeez. well, go do some physical therapy. And then they go in that person, they're like, well, uh, your stretch your not very strong. Let's, yeah, let's stretch this. Let's, I'm going to do some kinesio tape. Let's do a little ultrasound. <laughs> and maybe they do some strengthening, but it's like, okay, let's do this single leg leg press and they never address the underlying why. So yeah. I know not everyone has a great practitioner to work with. So I wanted to write something that could be the first step for That's people so awesome. to, to take that, to make that change the right way. Amazing. I'm getting that book for sure. When is it, when's it going on sale and where can they buy it? So it's on sale right now. Uh, Pre-sale started a couple months ago. It is going to come out January 19th, 2021. Um, yeah, so available all across the world on Amazon. So Amazon.com.ca uh, for Canada, UK, France, um, or if people don't use Amazon, uh, BookDepository.com, BarnesandNoble.com. Uh, but it's available for pre-order right now, and uh, yeah, it drops January nineteenth. That's gonna Beautiful. be sick. I'm for sure getting that. Hey, how did your first book? You know, how did did it? It's only on Amazon too. How did it yeah. do? I'm just curious. It, it's it's done well. Uh, you know the uh, the Squat Bible was my first book, and it Squat it wasn't, Bible. Yeah, it was. The, so the Squat Bible is a little bit different than this book. I, like I said, this book's 480 pages. The Squat Bible was basically 128 pages of you want to squat, you love squatting, here's how you do it as the fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And it sort of talks about, like you, like you mentioned, Doug, the joint by joint approach. Let's understand that every part of your body has a specific role to take to create, create quality movement. So if you want to squat well, you need symmetrical ankle mobility. Here's how you test it. Here's awesome. a couple fixes, sort of going through the body. Uh, a very quick read, you could read it in the weekend, but basically to understand uh, that the squat is the fundamental move, you know, building block that I think too often we have conceptually rearranged to think is only a, an exercise first, not a movement. Like I mentioned earlier in the show, how many of our grandparents can sit in a deep squat? Yeah. Right. Because when you say, Hey, do you squat? We think, well, I squat 300 pounds, not, right. Oh, I can mm -hmm. sit in a deep squat. Yeah. So when we rearrange that and, and get our movement of the squat down first, yeah. then add load, and it makes so many other things better. Brilliant. You you intro in the book. I watched uh, I watched you read a book today. Um, <laughs> but on on your website, you you read the intro and you talk yes. about the guy. I think everybody's probably aware of this video where he's squatting seven hundred something pounds. I think and yeah. uh, both his knees blow out. He tears every ligament and tendon in his knees. Um, and you were the one that kind of got him back to squatting. Mm -hmm a year later, 195 pounds at his first powerlifting meet. Um, with that backdrop, um, do you follow that story, kind of that, that whole rehab process with him throughout the book? Who was it? Who are we talking about? So, so his name is Josiah O'Brien. He's a uh, powerlifter, uh, strength and conditioning coach out in Kansas City. Um, so the story for those out there who have not heard of this, I, I made a I mini like documentary I've... on YouTube. It's just called Josiah's Story. Uh, Josiah was a powerlifter. Um, pretty strong guy at a meet. Unfortunately, he had been dealing with a little bit of knee pain in the past and 
Like most power lifters, you have no idea what a foam roller is. You've never done a single leg squat in your life. You eat, breathe, and live lifting big heavy weights, heavy metal blaring in the background, right? So I like rap, but yeah. Yeah, you you feel a little bit of knee pain. You just turn the Wu-Tang Clan up a little bit more, right? (laughs) Exactly. There it is. (laughs) Sniff team up. Josiah had had come out and he did like 635, easy, 645 or 50, easy. I think he went for 655 on his very last attempt, a feat only five pounds greater than his PR at the time. And on the descent, felt something snap. Mm. And he tore his patellar tendon on uh, his right side, his mm. ACL, PCL, MCL. His left knee buckled underneath him at 655 pounds, just had shifted just the one leg, tore his quad tendon on his other side, ACL, PCL, MCL. So oh as a blow, his legs God. are pinned underneath him. People rush to pull the bar off of him. He has to be transported to the local hospital in the bed of his buddy's truck because he can't sit with his knees bent. He ends up getting rhabdomyolysis because there was so much severe muscular damage that his kidney started shutting down. He ended up being in straight leg braces for 12 weeks because there was so much damage to the knees that the surgeons had to do so much repairing. Um, Works with a great surgeon out in Kansas City. Um, and he came to me the first day he could barely, he could barely walk. And within, he went, uh, underwent over 100 physical therapy visits spread across like nine, 10 months. And he finished that very last day. He said, I, he goes, I, I got to do one more me. He goes, just, just for the mental clarity of being like this injury doesn't define me. So we made a plan together and worked on our progressions and he, he ended up, he squatted 195 pounds. Now, to someone who had squatted 650 before, like that's nothing. But for him, just to go back into a meet that had previously crippled him and to say, you know, this injury doesn't define me, uh, it, was, it was very magical to see. It was very impactful to see. So um, it was one of those things that I, I mentioned in the book for the sake that that is the, not something that, that happens often. Yeah. It is the exception, not the rule. The rule is that often – these small aches and pains are just, just small things that, that lead us not to get our greatest performance potential and they're nagging and they're frustrating. And we want to throw our belt against the wall because our knees hurting the third week in a row. And I could feel it on that clean. And, you know, it's just maddening that there's not a solution. They're not always going to be something that creates this massive injury, but there are things that you still have power over. So I didn't, uh, I don't talk much more about Josiah's story throughout the rest of the book, but it was there to set the precedent that injuries are things that happen in the pursuit of great strength. Mm. They're not always massive things, but there are always going to be them. And that's one of the truths for weightlifting, powerlifting, CrossFit, strongman, is you are never going to be injury free. And the longer you're in those sports of performance, the more you know that there are always going to be those aches and pains. And the idea behind it was to say, I'm here to tell you there's, a, there's hope. There's, there's something that you can do to learn to become an educated athlete or coach to, to take away those aches and pains. They're not something you have to deal with to cover up uh, or to just keep pushing through. From experience, I can tell you that when you start that, when, achy is one thing. I mean, everyone gets achy, you know, as long as it, you sure. warm up and it goes away. But like, if that starts to get worse steadily, I'm telling you, Guys, power losers, weight losers, if it's starting to get worse progressively, that, that an injury is coming. And, you know, like I ignored my elbow years ago until my, tice, my tricep completely tore, triceps completely tore. So, like, listen to that stuff, man. If your knee is starting to get worse, there's yeah. an injury coming. And it could be – I just watched that. I almost threw up. And so, like, uh, it, it could be just like that, especially the knee. It always ends up, if you're a power lifter, in the squat. And it's – you, you, it pops when there's lots of weight on your back. It just looks terrible, but yeah. Yeah. Travis Bash, where can they, well, do you want to tell them social media? Everybody already follows you. Where can they <laughs> oh, find yeah. you? Squat, squat University. <laughs> across we know. <laughs> Man, I feel like it was like six months ago. I remember you making it. We just have 1 million people following the page. And I just looked before we hopped on here. It's like, 1.5 million human beings following you now. That's because he's so amazing. It's uh, incredible Aaron, you're, what you're you do. You're actually one of the really I, good I guys. It. And like, that's what makes me so mad when the, you, know, you have some strength 
coaches and athletes out there that sometimes will hate on him. But, you know, they'd be like, who's a PT to talk you out of squat? Like, Shut your mouth, man. Like, obviously, the dude gives so much more than anybody else. If I have to pick one person out of the entire industry that gives the most themselves, I got to go with you, man. So I appreciate you being on our show. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's yeah, – I mean, it, it truly amazes me when I see things like that. My, my goal wasn't just to – to a massively most of my followers, but to, my goal is to change the game and, and to give yeah. as much as I, I mean, there's not a single thing that's written in the book that's not already been said. And, and the idea I think nowadays is everyone wants to hide behind a paywall or only give you a part of the, the solution. And that's not how we change the world. I mean, if I, if you really want to make an impact, you want to, you have to give away as much of your information as you can for free. And uh, I think, I think good things happen as a result of that. Um, That's why I love this guy. Anders, he's like, this is the real, he's one of the very few in the industry. That's the real good guy. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome, man. Coach Travis Smash. Uh, Mashley.com and go buy that book. If you're a coach and you you don't buy that book, (laughs) you're not a good coach. So (laughs) if if you're getting coached by a guy who doesn't buy his book, you're, you're getting coached by a bad coach. (laughs) Doug Larson. Yeah, find me on Instagram. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on the show, dude. I've been looking forward yeah. to doing this again for a long time. And uh, I was stoked when your first book came out, and I'm actually more stoked for this book to come out. So me I, too. I can't wait to read it. Hey, yeah. thank you guys so much for having me on. It's truly an honor. I mean, like I yeah. said, I've been a fan of Barbell Shrug from day one. So uh, to be on and talking with you guys here today, uh, nothing better. Awesome. <laughs> I'm Anders Varner at Anders Varner. We are Barbell Shrug at Barbell underscore Shrug. Get over to barbellshrug.com forward slash Diesel Dad. That's where you got to hang out because right now I got to go to daycare. And I'm probably <laughs> not going to be able to work out again like I really was going to try to do this afternoon. Uh, Walmart, if you are in Palm Springs, San Diego, LA, or did I get San Diego in there? Vegas. I think I got them all. Vegas. There, Vegas. Vegas. There it is. We are on the shelves in performance nutrition. Thanks a lot for being on here. This is awesome. I feel like we could go another hour. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.